our second episode of the morning show on philanthropy and social change. We're very excited to be here with you today. And we've got an inspiring second guest, Silvana Stina. Silvana and I had the chance to participate at the School World Forum in a session that was really focused on unpacking what is not working with philanthropy and impact investing today. How do we resolve some of these challenges? And most importantly, how do we take advantage of the unique opportunity we have before us today to do things differently? And Silvana's story is one that has had a front row seat to all of this. And so Silvana, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. I always love spending time with you, Alix. I'm going to kick off your, this conversation with a pretty big question and we can unpack it together. But we know that philanthropy all the way up to impact investing, ESG investing is, is not really where it needs to be. I mean, I just saw a statistic uh, earlier last week that stated that the rise of donor advised funds has caused charities to lose $300 billion in perspective donations during the time of 2014 to 2018, because so many people with wealth are parking these funds in donor advice funds. Not enough is going out and funding these efforts. And then, of course, from your perspective, Sylvana, I know that you've looked at this in terms of not enough private sector investments going into successful companies. So tell us a little bit more from your perspective. You know, why is this so pro broken and, and how did we get here? Wow, that is a big question indeed. I think, you know, how much time do we have? I have so <laughs> many perspectives on this and, um, you know, I'm just one person. I mean, I think that, it, you know, we're living in a capitalistic society and there are a lot of good things about that. Um, but I also don't know that decisions are being made in a data-driven way by investors and um, wealthy, you know, individuals who mean very well in the world. And um, I think that some of that is because the data doesn't necessarily exist, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we talk about emerging markets and frontier markets as an asset class, there isn't much data, for example, on direct investments and um, what kind of exits are happening from those investments. Um, and emerging markets as an asset class are, is a very young you know, is a very young asset class as well. And so there isn't as much longitudinal data as there is, you know, in advanced economies like the United States and Europe. And when you really think about it, right, um, venture capital is, is really a generation old. Private equity is a little bit older than that. But um, so some of it is just, you know, the natural evolution of things. Um, but we are at a point, I believe, that we do have enough information to understand certain things but the data hasn't caught up to decision-making, right? So for example, um, in my, you know, in my view, there's every reason now, given the trajectory that the world has gone for us to be making investments in, in the private sector, in emerging economies that are now middle-class economies, largely due to tremendous philanthropic efforts. Bangladesh is a great example of that. You know, the Gates Foundation, BRAC and Grameen and other organizations have had a huge role to play in bringing Bangladesh to middle income status and improving its performance on social development indicators, which have formed the backbone of this now very strong middle class society. Um, and now we're ready for private investment. But I think that, um, you know, that's taken time and there's still a lot of biases in the way decision making takes place. I'll, I'll give another example. I think that investment cycles are also too short term and the people making decisions are also driven by different incentives than perhaps their, that, those of their organizations. Um, but even the organizations are perhaps driven by different incentives. So if you look at the World Bank Group and the International Finance Corporation, for example, right? The IFC has still not made a single investment in healthcare in Bangladesh, even during a pandemic, right? And so, and when you look at the allocations the IFC is making in healthcare right now, it's really focused on PPE and vaccines, which is needed, badly needed, right? When we look at what's happening in South Asia right now, the surge that's happening across the region, we're trying to figure out how to manage the crisis. And so it's great that the IFC is focused on that, but those are only short-term band-aids. What are we going to do to create systemic change? And 
the things that you're going to do to create systemic change are also going to be the drivers of longer term wealth in the region. Yeah. And so, but, but just because of the way investment cycles work and because of the way life that's happening right now is, is, is evolving, unfortunately, sometimes it, it, we don't have the benefit of that perspective. Absolutely. And there, there's something that you're saying that you really strikes me as well, which is, I mean, you know, ha having <coughs> been in the front lines of, you know, raising philanthropic capital and, and building strategies and also being in the impact investing trenches at water equity, it often feels like we're always behind. You know, it's like we are never taking advantage of these opportunities that it may not may not have all this perfectly proven data, but you know, early investors in Apple, for instance, did not have all the data when the world needed to find all the resources, you know, rightly so to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. We didn't have all the answers, but we go for it. And when it comes to really doing things differently as it pertains to system change, right? Addressing poverty, all, all of these big issues. All of a sudden, this desire to take risks, to be innovative, to, to bet on something different that has already a track record and potential for growth seems like pulling teeth, you know? And this is something that, that was really hard when even when we were raising our first impact investment fund at water equity, mm -hmm. you know, and there were all these data points pointing to the importance of water. And then it's like five years later, then investors start to show up. And, you know, we just missed that opportunity at the beginning to go big five years ago. And I, I feel like this mm -hmm. just went through my mind when we saw all this news about India. And I, I'm probably simplifying a little bit, but when you see what's happening in that country, I can't help but think, so much of this was preventable. I mean, what do you think is gonna happen when a significant proportion of the population does not have access to water and basic services? And so bringing this back to you, you know, something that really struck me when we spoke was, you know, hearing about Prava, uh, Prava Health and, and seeing what you're doing and, and knowing that your business tripled in growth, you know, year after year after year, and it's still hard for, it's still difficult for you to bring venture capital investors to the table. How is that possible? <laughs> so long. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that experience. Well, I think there are inefficiencies in the market for capital, right? There's, there's pockets of money that exist in the world. And unfortunately, I don't think that those pockets of money that exist necessarily match up to a, the things the world needs, but also B, necessarily the best businesses that are out there. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's just the reality. You know, um, I have found, you know, in my experience, well, first of all, I'll say during the pandemic, it's very surprising to me to see that there's so much money being thrown at healthcare in advanced economies, especially in the US. You see crazy deals happening in healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's not happening in emerging and frontier markets. Um, even though, as you we are, you know, there's there's not a better argument for investment in healthcare infrastructure than what we've all lived through, you know, in the last 15 months. And yet, despite that, those allocations are not happening, right? I mentioned the IFC, but it's not just the IFC. Across my colleagues, my, uh, you know, healthcare entrepreneur colleagues across emerging and frontier markets are saying the allocations are not there at the levels that they were even pre-pandemic. And I think some of that is because investors are risk averse due to the volatility in the financial markets. Um, but more specifically, I think in healthcare, what I've observed is to some extent, a bit of a lack of imagination in terms of innovation in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And this is not to be overly critical because again, every fund has its own mandate and its own reasons for making its decisions, which I fully respect. But I think that if you look at advanced economies, again, you look at China, Europe, US, you see healthcare models that are similar to mine, which is a brick and click model that combines infrastructure technology, which is the way we all interact with the world now, right? <laughs> sometimes we wanna to go to the store, sometimes we wanna order online, right? And that's how we're interacting with healthcare as well. Sometimes we wanna do a telemedicine visit, sometimes we wanna order our drugs online. Sometimes we have to go in and have an X-ray or actually be examined by a doctor. Mm -hmm. This is how our lives are now. But when it comes to healthcare investing in emerging and frontier markets, what I've found is that the traditional venture capital funds are really focused on pure play digital health. 
Um, they're not really looking at hybrid models like ours, that's number one. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the pure play infrastructure investors, which are really looking to deploy much larger sums of capital. Um, some of them, you know, their minimum ticket size is starting at 30 or $50 million, which I, at my stage of my business, can't absorb at this point, right? And so I think those are some of the levels of challenges that we face, is that it just, it's just taking time, as you said, for the data to catch up to the reality of decision making. Absolutely. And I know that we have 10 minutes left. And so I, I really, I want to circle back on the most important question of our chat, which is forward looking, knowing that everything you just shared today was, was incredibly insightful. But, you know, I think about this big commitment, right, that Larry Fink, you know, the Black Rock team makes every year in January and this, this particular year, whereas you know, companies need to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And I'm just gonna tie that goal with every other goal that's gonna impact our ability to do this. And it means that we really have 10 years, right? The, the new 2050 is really 2030 because what we are able to do in the next decade is gonna determine if we come even remotely close to that goal in 2050. And so there has to be a mindset, a behavioral change within this industry. And I'll call it, you know, the philanthropic, philanthropic and impact investing as well as ESG investing industries. And so if I took, you know, that point to you, Silvana, and I had a magic wand and I said, you know, I could give you unlimited resources, no restraints, what would you do with those resources and how would it change the path? Or I would say, how would it help you address the barriers you know, that you're facing today? Not big love question. That question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, love that question. Well, I think about what you described about your experience with water equity, right? That like five years later, they're like, well, why haven't you done this? We'll give you money to do this. And if you had had the money five years ago, you would have done it, right? And so my company is in its fourth year of operations now. And as you mentioned, we've been, you know, graced with really tremendous growth and really grateful to be able to serve the community, especially during a global pandemic. Um, there's a lot that we haven't done that we could have been doing, you know, and a lot that we haven't done that we could have, that we've done that we could have done better, you know? Um, and so, Wow, if I had unlimited resources, there's so many things that I would do with it. I think number one is really deeply investing in human capital, um, really improving um, our access to trainings. There's a whole business plan to be written around actually a separate training institute. Um, the nursing and technician shortage is even worse than the doctor shortage in Bangladesh actually. Um, but really also bringing in this concept of patient-centric healthcare into the way care is delivered. Because what we know is that when patients are engaged with their medical professionals and managing their health, you get better healthcare outcomes. And so I think that all of that, you know, all of that I think um, would be a really big area of investment for us as well, as well as, you know, really deepening this brick and click healthcare model and really trying, really finally taking the clinical innovations that we've built into our model to the next level. And that's really the secret sauce, I think, of what we're building that we haven't been able to do as quickly as, as we'd like, right? Like really, you know, we're in a market where we have an opportunity to leapfrog. We don't have HIPAA. We don't have all of the privacy constraints you have in the West. Patients actually own their medical records. Patients own their data, but there's no centralized repository. We have brought Bangladesh's first patient app um, where patients can access all their medical records in one place. When they bring us their records, they can wheel, scan, and store it for them. Um, but really using that data to build a patient super app, you know, that allows patients to interact and, you know, interact with a tool that helps them to manage their symptoms. For example, we've built a tool to manage remotely COVID. And um, we'd like to really scale that up. We think it has future applications to chronic disease. And the ultimate goal is to keep people out of the hospital. Right. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the care innovations that we'd really like to take to the next level, but we think can be scaled well beyond Bangladesh and across emerging markets to improve efficiency in all of our healthcare systems. These are a couple of the things that come to mind, but that's just <laughs> with respect to, you know, my, my business. I think we have 170 million people in Bangladesh that we need to serve. We currently have 200,000 people in our network. So we have a long way to go to doing that. Building out infrastructure in parallel to the digital piece is absolutely critical because I strongly believe that we need both. 
Yeah, no, that's so wonderful. And Silvana, I, I can tell that you are, you are such a professional, like you just, you have all of these points um, perfectly articulated. I mean, I, I feel like even for someone like myself, who's not, you know, fully knowledgeable of how the healthcare system works in, in Bangladesh, I just, I, I'm such a fan. I, I really feel like everybody oh, so kind. <laughs> hearing what you're sharing today. And, you know, I, I think two more things come to mind as I'm hearing you speak, which is that I think it's the world doesn't fully or may not fully grasp that, you know, 85% of the world lives in emerging markets. Right. And, and right. yet, you know, we have factored into our conversations every day. I, you know, COVID-19, this pandemic has really further accentuated how we are all interconnected, right? What happens over here impacts what's happening over there. Um, and yet- And 80% of venture dollars go to businesses headquartered in New York, Massachusetts, or California. And there you so go. So look at that inverse, you know, it's incredible. And that's not even the emerging markets of the United States. Forget about Louisiana and Detroit, right? Right, 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 right. And, and, and so it brings us back to a really important point, right? So then you go all the way up, you know, the food chain, I'll say, and you see that, you know, most VC firms don't, I think the statistics was, excuse me, that 12% of leadership in uh, VC firms are women. I mean, it's a very, very low percentage. Like we don't, we can definitely say with confidence that we do not lead that industry. We don't make a majority of those decisions. So in our two minutes remaining, <laughs> the thought here for us, Silvana, which we'll continue to talk about, you know, in, in, in future times is can having more women, you know, making decisions at that level for venture capital firms, and not just women, but women from diverse backgrounds, right? I mean, we, we just, we have to have, we have to look at the power structures also, particularly for women from emerging markets, you know, how do we get to a place where there are more Silvanas in the world who are driving these decisions, especially, you know, given your experience, and, and do you think that's going to make, that could make a profound difference in, in how all of this is shaking out? Absolutely. I mean, the data is very clear, right? VCG published a report in 2018 that for every mm -hmm. dollar of funding, female-led startups generated 78 cents, while male-founded startups generated less than half of that. Um, you know, female founder, founder companies perform 63% better on average than all male founding teams. And I think the point is about diversity. It's not that women are better than men. It's that when you have diverse teams at the table, you have better decision-making. And I think that's the key, you know, we've got to, we've got to encourage young women, um, to pursue these careers and not be discouraged by perhaps lack of role models in those industries, but we have so many more than we did before. And that's the thing that I think we have got to remember is that the, the tide is turning, um, but the data is very clear that we need more women in leadership and venture. We need more women-led businesses, um, mm -hmm. and we just need more diversity in decision-making across the board. So Silvana, tell us a little bit more, something you've touched upon in, in past conversations that we've had. You know, there's all this talk about investing in women and girls and, and particularly investing in, in women. Is that really happening? I mean, give us your, your perspective. It's definitely not happening. I think, you know, in 2020, the um, venture funding that went to women, both as a percentage of total venture funding and in absolute terms went down. And um, even then, I think it was, you know, around one, less than 2%, right? And so, you know, I think, I think that's, again, going back to the theme that we've been talking about, which is, you know, linking data to decision making. Uh, we all know that investing in female founders is, is usually on average a better bet than investing in male founders. Um, or investing in diverse teams certainly always improves bottom lines. But um, unfortunately, People are talking about investing in women and girls. People are talking about investing in healthcare, but the money is not matching up, right? The actual allocations of capital are not matching up to the things that we seem to know very well need in more investment. 
Thank you, Silvana. I I definitely share your concern, and and it's it's something. It's a it's a really disappointing reality that I, I certainly had a front row seat to that in terms of water and sanitation. And and, and in my days at Water Equity, I am hopeful that as there are more women like you who are calling the shots and are in positions of leadership to bring a diverse point of view and get these industries to take some bolder risks that are necessary, that hopefully this will start to change. I hope so too. We we keep at it every day, right, Elise? We have to keep fighting the good fight. I'm optimistic as well. I completely agree. Silvana, thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your insights and your experience with us here today. I can't wait for you to come back and for us to tackle all these other points. But, um, you know, we're going to we're going to keep we're going to keep an eye on Prava Health and your journey and, and seeing how things flourish over the next few years. Thank you so much, Elise. Can't wait for the next time.